Welcome to Kingdom Life Church and today's message with Drs. Dennis and Jennifer Clark brought to you by Full Stature Ministries and its dedicated supporters. We are here to equip you with the how-to tools and practical effective ways for empowering your Christian journey. Join us as we explore teachings that bring healing through forgiveness and ignite transformation in both individuals and families. For more resources, join our mission. Visit us at forgive123.com. Let's embark on this journey together. Anyway, welcome to the Kingdom Life Church and Full Statue Ministries. Um, thank you for joining us online and here in the room with us, which is even better than online. Uh, Got to be face to face sometimes. It's it's so much. There's so much difference in the. There's a great technology out there, so we can be around the world and, and what have you, but. If you can be here, be here. I really, I mean, really, there's nothing like being in the in the presence of people, in in God's people. Amen. Amen. Um, something that would, the Lord was was speaking to me recently, um, as we were we were out on on our annual family uh, vacation a couple weeks back, and the Lord was speaking to me about Nehemiah and building. And, and I, I couldn't shake it, and I really didn't know how to formulate it, what it was about, what was going on. Um, but, and I studied a lot, and I got like, probably wrote 40 pages of notes and things, but I don't have that here today, so don't worry. <laughs> We're not going to be here till tomorrow. Uh, but what was, what was interesting about it was the, there's two elements that um, stood out the most, right? Well, maybe three. Well, two elements. Focus and distraction. And we had already started the focus challenge back, you know, a couple of weeks ago when Dad talked about the focus challenge. And um, I thought that was interesting, but I didn't put two and two together until later. Focus and distraction. And the other one was is rebuilding and building. And that's not just, and, and that's like spiritual building and, and growing up, you know, uh, our whole the whole ministry of full stature is about growing up, right, in the Lord, maturing. Um, and so those th- those two things stood out when I was studying, and I wanted to really look at that. Um, when I was praying the other day and trying to get my, my notes to a, a reasonable size and amount, um, I think it was Tuesday night. Somebody had brought up one of the, one of the people that were attending on Tuesday night brought up Isaiah fifty eight twelve, where it says your people will rebuild the ancient ruins and they'll raise up the age old foundations. You will be called repairer of the breach, the of broken walls and restorer of streets with dwellings. It's Isaiah fifty eight twelve, and I was like that hit home so hard, and I know that it's a time of building, and it's a time of rebuilding and restoring and and reforming, right? And, and at least that's what God is moving us, you know, into. And I want to be a part of that, right? Don't you? Yeah. Um, and when I, when, I, when I heard that, and I know that that was one of the, one of the main, um, going back several years now to when I graduated Bible school, that was our class's scripture verse that we, we had just for our class was Isaiah 58, 12, that we would be called the repairers of the breach in that class. So I thought, well, that's really neat. Anyway, it's more than really neat. It's God. It's, it's something that he's really wanting us to, to, to take hold of during the season, um, that we're going through and, and further back. I was going through my, some of my old text messages and and to, to some, some of the people that were going through, um, different things and they wanted to hear the message from, Sunday or Tuesday or whatever, and I was relaying the messages to them, and I, and I was just going through and deleting them all and cleaning up my phone. And I came across this one, and I was like, what is this woman talking about? She was so affected by this particular statement that I made on a Tuesday night. Um, and so I, I went and did a research on it, and it ended up being almost to the day. It was September 19th. And I know that Connie was there, because I remember but it was something that was um, between that Sunday and that Tuesday. The Lord was speaking to me about, Arise, O God, let your enemies be scattered. 
<laughs> and it's such a powerful statement. If you did any research on that at all, do it. It's, it's one of those things where if you just let your, your spirit soak it in, let God arise. Arise, O God, let your enemies be scattered. In the same, in the same time, in that tam- same time frame, I, talked to, I was talking to my t- uh, wife, Gwen, about it, and she said, I was getting something similar, but it was let faith arise. And I was like, wow, I, don't, I, I wasn't hearing that exact phrase, but I'm going to study. And when I studied, what came up was the story in um, Matthew 15 about the Canaanite woman who came to Jesus uh, during that time of when he was around in uh, Tyre, I believe it was the city of Tyre. And, and she wanted help for her, her daughter, who was very, was very tormented by demonic things and what have you. And she, she cried out to Jesus to help. And he ignored her at first. Um, he wasn't focused on the Canaanites at the time. Before the resurrection, everything was about restoring the Jewish, the people, God's people, right? And so his statement that he made to her, what did he say? He, sa- he said, should I give the bread of the children to the dogs? And I was like, wow, that was mean. But, you know, at the time, that was actually slang for anybody that wasn't Jewish. It was like the, the Gentiles the, and the, um, the Canaanites. and They were the enemies of God at that point. And so that was, that was something that he said that they, so that everybody would understand. He was making a point of, for the people around him because he knew it was going to happen, right? And she said, well, God, even the, the dogs get the scraps from the children that they, when they fall to the floor, right? And that's what let faith arise meant at that time. Let your faith arise. Jesus was so impressed with her faith that he said, Woman, you have great faith. Your request is granted. And her daughter was healed from that very moment. What the Lord told me through this is that what we've been comfortable, that we've been comfortable too long under the table. We've been picking up the scraps and, hey, they're great. We've been making ends meet. We've been doing everything like that, that we can do with what we have. But the Lord says it's time to come sit at the table. I prepared for you a table. And this was all exact. This was like three days off. Today's the 22nd. It was the 19th last year that this was going on. And he's still speaking it today. And the message is coming from this. So just follow me. (laughs) What the Lord told me through this is that we've been comfortable under the table for far too long. As a church, as a congregation, as a people. Some of us, we've been content with the scraps. We've been doing okay and actually doing well compared to some. But he's inviting us to the table that he's prepared for us. Not only that, but he showed me more about the table. And I had a dream at that time that, that all the pastors got together at, at Brad and Vicky's house. And it was pure and white and everything was white and golden. And it was just like, wow, we had a really cool house. But the spread of the table was so awesome. And it had all these foods and everything put together on the table for us. And we took part as pastors were, that, were, that were there in, in what, we, what I believe was like the hidden manna in communion. With, with, with Christ himself, basically, is what it was. And, and then afterwards, we had this like, hugely emotional and, and ecstatic experience when we, we went outside, because it was like we, we met, we, 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 we congregated, we had that communion with God, and now we're bringing him into, out to, right, the city, out to the nations. And so we were jumping and it was raining and it was like fire in the rain and it was really cool. The, the dream was awesome. But the way that, the way that he, sh- he showed me this is, yeah, that table, that's for us. We should not be under, on the floor under the table anymore. And, and just as like the, the Gentiles were back then, as good as dogs, we are not. 
We are not that way, and we should not see ourselves that way anymore. He's prepared for us what in Psalm 23. You prepare for me a table in the presence of my enemies, in the presence of our enemies, despite the internal issues, despite the external issues, the people that come against us, the things that are said, he's prepared a table for us in the middle of it all. And they're not invited, just you. <laughs> because of the communion aspect of it, right? I had in that time when I was like, what, is this, what does this mean that you set a table? And he showed, he had, I had like a little mini vision and it was me sitting at the table across from him. But then he said, come up here. Come up here. And I was like a little guy, a little like the size of a monkey. You ever see like a, a baby monkey climbing up on his mother? It's like really tiny. And it climbs up the hair and sits there. I love animals, some, some animals anyway. Um, but I was like that. I was really tiny. I thought I was, I was just nothing, you know. I climbed across the table that he had set up, <laughs> sitting across from me. And I climbed up his shoulder and I stood at the top of his shoulder and I looked down at his viewpoint. What was he looking at? And I saw the entire earth and I saw the nation. And I was like, wow, it's so small. And I was just blown away. I was blown away by all this Stuff that looked so small that that used to be so big, from where I where I was, you know, before and in that position. He said, "Come up here, so that I might share what God wants us to be and where He wants us to go and what He wants us to see." I saw myself very small, like a grasshopper, and <laughs> looking at the Canaanites. I asked him, can I, can we stay here? I was just curious. And he said, yes, of course, you're all welcome. And I think that one of the strategies that I was praying for at the time was to be able to see that we aren't supposed to be under the table. We are either supposed to be one-on-one -on -one with him in communion with him, but in that communion, we're, suppo we're supposed to be able to see the way he sees, know the way that he knows. You know, when we talk about like perception or, you know, peace precedes perception, love precedes perception, it's his nature that perce precedes the way that he sees from his perspective, right? So we partake in communion with, of his nature. We're able to see then from his side. It's a wonderful thing. I remembered that at that time in our family, we were taking communion every night um, since the beginning of the Feast of Trumpets. Um, we were also doing it every Tuesday night, and it was just like it's a symbol of what he really wanted and what he wants and what he desires with us is that communion and that fellowship with us so that we can not just feel good about you know ourselves or whatever but it was for the 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 interconnecting ourselves with him and having in building that that strengthening that relationship um, and deepening it it would be it's a time that that we listen and we sit and we not just feel good by listening to the cool music that you know that gene is playing on the piano or or whatever it was that it's a time to sit and listen to strategies being poured out. To discuss strategies and to show us things from his perspective. That's what it is. That's what it's about. It really is. So I said uh, at the end of the, the little discussion that I had on, on, that, on that recording um, from that particular Tuesday night, I said at the end, I said, so I'm waiting for a blueprint. I'm waiting for the strategy. I'm waiting for wisdom, the practical application of whatever this is that, that God is showing me during this time. Let's pray for blueprints. What are blueprints good for? Blueprints are good for building. What is Nehemiah all about? Building, rebuilding, reformation. 
And I was like, oh, maybe this is part of the blueprint. <laughs> Who knows? But I said, you know, in my prayer time at the, at the end of my studies of this, I said, arise, O oh God, let your enemies be scattered. I'm going to let faith arise as we're moving towards him in this process, right? Let faith arise. Amen. When I, when I said that, he said, you've been waiting for these strategies. You call them challenges. I call them strategies. I went, wow, just in the past, well, since the end of July, we've had the peace challenge, the focus challenge, the joy challenge, the discernment challenge was last week. I was like, hmm. And he said, yeah, all of these things are divine strategies for the time ahead that, that we need to really look at. And so what I, I'm going to do, um, not today, but probably next week, is I'm going to try to put those all together for us and show you why and how to apply this. Um, <laughs> so it's very important. I don't know why, but I mean, if you look at if you look at how even the timing of the message and how they came out was first we we had the peace challenge and we talked about that at the end of July, beginning of. August, right? We had it all through August was a piece for us as a congregation. Then we talked about finding joy. And I had one message, I think that had two. And the, and the joy challenge we discussed. Peace, peace, when you, when you go deeper and you have the peace of God and you go deeper, that joy bubbles up. It, 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 made, it made sense that it went that direction. And then we went, we went back to focus. We got to remain focused on him. And he, and, and, and dad taught on what? It was the keeping the main thing, the main thing. And then we had the focus challenge, two parts, I think. Focus. We had the, 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 the taking apart the, the, the house of thoughts. Again, that's focus, getting rid of distraction. You know, all of these things, it, it's making sense. To me, when I look back and say, "Hey, God is God says that these are strategies. Strategies are not just like strategies. Are, this is like military strategy. This is not just strategies of how to live and be happy. These are like military type strategies, life and death type strategies for for now and for the times ahead, for how you should be walking." He gave us the joy challenge. What is joy? Joy is our strength. Peace protects and guides. Joy is our strength. Without discernment, we can't actually, I mean, going into the message that I was going to bring today is about distractions, and I wanted to call it the Nehemiah no. And I'll explain that later. But, but the thing is, is without fully aware of of, of um, developing your discernment, we could be saying no and we can be saying yes to the wrong things that really are just distractions. And the one thing that I think that I was going to talk about, like focus, 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 but we did the focus challenge. We know what we're doing <laughs> with the focus challenge, right? But it's just more about how easily we can be distracted and that, and that there's going to be a lot of distractions. I mean, there's a lot of stuff politically. There's a lot of stuff just happening in the world in general. Um, that are happening, you know, going to be happening through the end of the year, beginning of the next year. Um, a lot of stuff that we don't look forward to. <laughs> Some stuff that we do. <laughs> I look forward to God. Period. And and the thing is, is you know, I don't I don't like to to like put my nose in social media too much. Um, I want to know what God says, and that stuff distracts me. You know, um, it's meant to be like that. It's it's like eye candy or brain candy or whatever you want to call it, you know, flipping through Instagram or whatever it's called, you know, um, 
it sucks you in. The latest news articles and things, just they suck you in. And I don't want to be there. I want to hear and know what God is saying so that I could be like Nehemiah and be like, no, I need to be doing what God wants to be done. And, and I think that that's where we really all need to be. Uh, I can't make you do you guys do anything, but I want to I want to make sure that you I stress the fact that we have the peace challenge, we have the dismantling the house of thoughts, we have the joy challenge, we have the focus challenge, the discernment challenge, and we have today's message and tomorrow and, and next week's probably too. We need to be looking at these. I'll even I'll even make a little playlist on and stick a link underneath the in the description for today's so that you can get a playlist of those last messages. I know you guys are all here for that. Most of you guys heard all of them, but there's something about them. And I'll bring out the key points next week that I feel like God is, is speaking specifically. But so for today, actually, all of that was, <laughs> all of that was just stuff, right? I was distracted. No. Um, the, the, the Nehemiah no and dealing with distractions um, first, I want to bridge the connection between the message that we explored last week, that was the, ser the, the discernment cha uh, challenge, and where we're headed to today. Now, you might be wondering why we went to the discernment first, just like the, I told you there was a pattern that, that God was using. The pattern then for discernment was because it's the foundation for saying the right no, the correct no. A lot of people, us, you know, a lot of people like me and myself, my, my wife, we're like, we're rescuers for the most part. And we struggle sometimes with unsanctified mercy. We want to help where we see there's a need, even if God didn't tell us to. <laughs> you know what happens when my, well, like my kids find something that they want to do for me, and I didn't ask them to do it? It's kind of upsetting to me sometimes, especially if it's like turns out bad. I love it. I mean, I love their heart. Their heart's in the right place. But it's like, I have to, you have to teach them to not do things when they're not asked. Otherwise, it's like, you know, you, have to, you can ask the Lord. And if the Lord says, then it usually turns out really good. <laughs> but, if, but if it's like something, hey, I just made your coffee. I'm like, oh, no. Because <laughs> I, I go in the kitchen and there's coffee grounds everywhere and spilled stuff everywhere and this and that. But, but their heart is in the right place, right? But it's still, oh, no. So discernment needs to be the foundation for them, you know, as well. Have you ever been working on something that was really important and maybe like a project at work or planning for a family event or even trying to finally clean out that garage, which I don't even want to go there. Our garage is <clears throat> something, something else. But then, your, you know, your phone buzzes or your, you get a text message or something. You're, you wonder what's happening on social media. You get distracted, and then all of a sudden, it's like 20 minutes later, and it's like, what, what happened? Um, where did the time go? I think that we've all done that. We've all been there. Sometimes it lasts hours, unfortunately, that you can get sidetracked. Um, and, they, and the distractions really come from like all different directions, and they're all different sizes. Some of them are very subtle. Um, some of them are obvious. Um, you know, the, the subtle ones would be more like thoughts, like maybe this isn't worth my time or, or maybe I shouldn't be doing this and I should be doing something else or, you know, all of those time wasters. You know, time is a huge, well, time is a precious commodity that cannot be re re replaced. And so what you spend your time on, who you spend your time with is super valuable to God. It's something that we don't have a lot of. It's, it's, it's something that is a, it's a commodity that we can't replace. So those things are very important. Distractions are very important. What happens when the distraction isn't just about wasting time? What, what happens when it comes dressed up as a good thing? A good opportunity or an, an important conversation or a well-meaning friend, you know, stops by. How do we know exactly when to say no? And more importantly, how do we do it without feeling guilty or afraid of, or being unsure? We have to develop that discernment.
Now, the Nehemiah no, it's not just any no. The Nehemiah no is like, I think I explained, like the, the kids when they want a cookie. I want a cookie. Can I have a cookie? I want a cookie. I want a cookie. I want a cookie. I want a cookie. And eventually, you throw the whole box at them and say, <laughs> whatever, stop. <laughs> and they know that. That's why they do it. It's like an inborn thing. It, it, it's a strategy that they didn't need to even, it was like in their blood. But they know it. And, and uh, I mean, if you look at the way that, I mean, if you look at the story of Nehemiah, it, they did the same thing to him. They, they, come on down, meet with us. Come on down, come on down, come on down, come on down, come on down. And, and it never worked. The Nehemiah no is basically saying, no, you can't have a cookie until after dinner. Final. No matter how many times you ask, you can't have one until after dinner. It's a, there's a finality to it. There's a um, brazenness to it. It was a firmness to it that you can't refute, right? Nehemiah was called to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem, but he faced constant distraction. Some was blatant. Some were disguised as opportunities. He had every reason to get to sidetracked to entertain these distractions, but instead he chose a firm no. And why did he do that? And more importantly, how did he give that, have that clarity and the confidence to say no without hesitation? Last week we learned about, like I said, uh, discernment and its spiritual ability. It's a spiritual ability to, to really tell or perceive the true nature of things, whether they come from God, the flesh, or the enemy. It's about recognizing the power or the source behind the words, the choices, the thoughts, even feelings. We explored how discernment is not just a natural intuition, but a spiritual one, a crucial tool for everyone that's useful to navigate the complexities of life. Why is it so important? Because discernment is the key to knowing when to say no the correct way. Nehemiah is a prime example of someone who exercised discernment to stay focused on God's purpose. He didn't just say no to the distractions that randomly or impossibly came up. He did it with wisdom and clarity. He knew that his work, which was rebuilding of the walls, was a great work, he called it, and that he could not abandon the, what he was doing. But how did he know when to say no and when to say yes? He knew because he could discern the difference between a distraction and an opportunity. And this is where the discernment challenge, of course, prepared us for this particular message. Um, some distractions came wrapped in attractive packages. They might even seem like blessings or answers to prayer. Nehemiah faced offers that seemed peaceful, like invitations to meet and talk. But discernment <laughs> helped him see through the truth. They were traps meant to pull him away from his mission. So why would discernment need taught before? Because, well, without it, we might say yes to the wrong things and no to the right ones, right? Before we can confidently and wisely say no, like Nehemiah, we need to have the clarity about what is truly from God and what is not. And discernment lays the ground for that. <clears throat> During the times, I'm going to give you a little bit of historical context of Nehemiah and the time that it was happening um, and whatnot. First, I want to actually entertain something with you that is completely off subject. It's a distraction, I know. But I, I, have, a, I have an interesting animal fact that I have to share. <laughs> you don't have to take notes for this. But I found it extremely interesting that ravens, you know, you know the bird that Edgar Allan Poe wrote about, the uh, rapping, tapping on my chamber. Ever since... They had an air of mystery around them. They are very extremely intelligent birds, and they can have all kinds of different, mimic all kinds of different things, including the sounds of like toaster ovens and people's voices. And I mean, buzzers and alarms, all kinds of crazy stuff, right? 
You know what a group of them are called? Is anybody? A conspiracy. Interesting, right? Anybody know what a group of crows is called? A murder. Why? It's very interesting, right? They like to eat their prey live. They like to eat live things. So they are actually murdered. They're committing murder. What do you call a group of vultures or buzzards? This one was good. Close? Well, not really. It's called a wake. A wake. Like a funeral? Anyway. You know what? <laughs> you know they're called something else if they're not actually eating a dead animal? Because that's all they eat is dead animals. That's why they, they call it a wake. Do you know what, what they're called when they're not eating a dead animal, but they're together? A committee. <laughs> no joke. No joke. That's what they're called. When they're flying together in the sky, they're called a kettle, but I, I don't understand that. I do understand committee, especially with all the politics and garbage that's happening right now. A committee. So they wait around where they're discussing, you know, who they're going to bury next, right? That's my free part. Remember it if you want, but you don't have to. <laughs> so, the times of Nehemiah. What happened was, it, <clears throat> the histor in the historical context, Nehemiah's story occurs during the Persian period, about a century after the Babylonian exile, when all the Jewish people were scattered, basically, and taken to, into captivity. When the Jewish people had begun returning to their homeland, uh, they started to rebuild the temple there. Um, the exile had been the result of uh, Israel's unfaithfulness to God in about 586 BC. Um, there was both the, the you know the the physical uh, collapse of Jerusalem and also the symbolic uh, nature of it, which was God's covenant people. Um, the exile represented the spiritual engagement from God, or uh, spiritual estrangement from God, while the return symbolized the restoration and redemption. And that's where we're, it's a time of restoration and redemption right now. And God is helping us build. And this is what's happening, just to throw that out. The exile represented a spiritual estrangement from God. So this was a period of vulnerability the temple had been rebuilt under Ezra, where he brought in the law back, right? And the, the spiritual aspect, I mean, the, the word aspect of it, right? And so the, the, the temple started being rebuilt. It was, you know, finished before the walls on the outside were built. And, and that was like a, a whole period of, of vulnerability. And um, so the period of, of time where Nehemiah actually, you know, came into the picture was after the temple was built, after the exile, and the people started coming back. It's a, it's a process, actually, you see it over and over again in restoring God's people, restoring people in general in, in the way that God sees it. He always starts from the inside out. And so it's a, just a perfect picture of how God restored the temple and then, and then eventually the walls, which represent the city or the expansion of the kingdom, right? It's a, it's a principle. You'll see it through, all throughout Scripture over and over. So anyway, um, Nehemiah had a, a heart for the restoration. He was a man of prayer. He was, um, one of the most profound aspects of him was his prayer life, in fact. And before he actually began working on the rebuilding, we see him that he was fasting and mourning and praying intensely for months. And this is all in Nehemiah 1. He has his own book. Check it out, man. His first instinct upon hearing of Jerusalem's desolation was to turn to God in prayer. That was his first instinct. It, was, it, it, it deeply burdened him to know that his people, because he was Jewish, that his people were, were, were vulnerable. Um, he also understood that he went to God in prayer because he needed... He, he, he understood the revelation of the fact that 
the spiritual renewal must precede the physical action. The spiritual renewal must precede the spiritual or the physical action. So it wasn't just personal. It was an accessory. It was pleading for the sins of, of his people and identifying with their brokenness. At the time, Nehemiah was the cupbearer to the king. He served as the cupbearer to Artaxerxes, which was a position of great trust and influence. It wasn't for his own purposes, but God used his influence to be able to maintain the, or grab the resources that he needed and the permission to rebuild uh, Jerusalem's walls. He was a visionary leader. His leadership goes, actually goes beyond practical skills. He has a deep vision for restoration and, and of God's people and Jerusalem. His passion is not just for a physical project, but for the spiritual renewal of Israel. He saw the city of Jerusalem as a reflection of God's glory and was driven by the desire to restore that glory. He was not content to see God's people remain in disgrace and his vision of rebuilding the walls was an act of restoring their identity as God's covenant people. The walls of Jerusalem symbolized much more than just a protection from the enemies. They were a physical rep representation of the boundaries that God has established for his people, both moral and spiritual. The walls represented the separation from surrounding pagan cultures and a call to holiness. In many ways, the broken walls of, of Jerusalem mirrored the broken spiritual condition of the people. Rebuilding the walls symbolized the reestablishment of spiritual boundaries, purity, and identity. Nehemiah wasn't just rebuilding the physical walls. He was leading the people in rebuilding their relationship with God. That's all of our, all pastors here, that's our hearts. <laughs> that you would know your identity in Christ and that you would continue building and rebuilding your relationship with the Lord. His reforms didn't stop with the, just the construction of the wall, though. Nehemiah enforced the Sabbath. He corrected injustices and he led people to renew their covenant with God. The, the rebuilding of the walls was just a, a precursor to this deeper spiritual renewal. But Nehemiah's work symbolized a refortification of both physical and the spiritual in Jerusalem. One of the most striking elements in Nehemiah's story that I thought was the consistent opposition that he faced. It was this constant, and some of you guys know what constant opposition feels like. It's just it's the, the warfare and the attacks and the one thing after another after another. If it's not the you know, the clogged toilet, it's the dishwasher busted and the kid that just, you know, messed the bed. Or it's, it's just like one thing after another. Some things are a lot more serious than that. And a lot of people right now are going through a lot of different things. Um, some of the people that we're familiar with are going through some really hard stuff. But it's like one thing after another. After, it's just an onslaught of wearing us down. He was able to successfully navigate those circumstances and they were pretty, I mean, his life was at stake in a lot of the cases. So I'd say it was pretty serious at that time. In fact, even during the, 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 the whole process, you probably, if you knew anything about the Nehemiah story and the rebuilding of the wall, that they had a sword in one hand and the other hand they were building. That's how volatile the situation was with the people around them and the, and the enemies and the opposition. Um, is pretty crazy stuff, right? But they maintained, and they did better than just maintain. They really overcame, and did, a miracle did happen. The three main culprits that stand out most of the time in the, in the story is Sanballat, Tobiah, and Geshem. And they symbolize spiritual forces that resist the work of restoration. Plain and simple. I mean, it's almost obvious. These figures mocked and tried to discourage the rebuilding efforts of Nehemiah um, in chapter 2. They represent those who oppose God's purpose and seek to undermine his people. Their tactics of ridicule, deception, and physical threat can be seen as a reflection of the spiritual warfare, warfare that uh, accompanies any work. Any work of God's restoration has those things. 
come against. Nehemiah teaches us a profound lesson in the art of spiritual warfare. He does not ignore the threats, but he responds in both prayer and action. Prayer first, always, then action. You have to have both in order to be effective in the kingdom. His famous exhortation for the people, don't be afraid of them. Remember the Lord who is great and awesome and fight for your families. That was Nehemiah 4.14. This highlights his belief in God's sovereignty and the need for vigilance, both. Nehemiah's dual response, working with one hand and holding a weapon in the other, symbolizes that the need to balance action and spiritual defense is uh, represented. The sword, of course, is the sword of the spirit, uh, you know, the word of the Lord. And the mission of what the work, what he was doing was actually the obedience of God. So you got this, the word of God and the obedience to his word. Nehemiah didn't work alone. Of course, Ezra, there was a scribe. He played a crucial role in the spiritual revival of the people. Uh, reading the teachings of the laws of Moses in Nehemiah 8. He, he did public reading of the word. He uh, brought conviction and repentance to the people. One of, the, one of the, the key revelations I got out of that was true restoration cannot happen apart from the word of God. The people needed to be able to hear the word of God. They needed to be convicted. They needed to repent. Nehemiah understood that the physical rebuilding oh, Nehemiah understood that the physical rebuilding of Jerusalem was meaningless without a corresponding spiritual renewal, the covenant renewal, in which the people confessed their sins and committed to live according to God's law, symbolized the return of their identity as God's chosen people. The law was central to their identity, and without it the walls would have no lasting meaning. Nehemiah's leadership led the people's Recommitment and the covenant symbolize restoration for their spiritual heritage and destiny. Nehemiah was, was personally, he had personal integrity and he was completely selfless. Pretty, pretty, pretty good guy. Nehemiah's refusal, he, t he refused to take the governor's food allowance because he didn't want to, he didn't want to stress the people. He didn't want to put a burden on the people that were there. So even if it, even it, while it was okay and due and you know allotted for him to do, he didn't want to burden the people. He was selfless. He was, and, and his commitment to the welfare of the community shown through that. Right. He was a foreshadowing of Christ. I mean, you look at you look at what happened. He came from. He was Artaxerxes' cupbearer. In a position of authority leaves, travels a thousand miles, which probably took several months on the donkey. That was before he got started on the wall, just to get there from. But as a foreshadowing of Christ, Nehemiah's sacrificial leadership and his commitment to the restoration of God's people can be seen just like Christ did. He left a position of privilege and power to serve and restore a broken people. Christ left glory, the glory of heaven, to restore the humanity to God. Nehemiah's willingness to sacrifice for the sake of God's people points to the ultimate sacrifice of Christ, who gave his life for our redemption and humanity. Nehemiah's legacy was a call to spiritual renewal, a pattern for spiritual reformation. The story offers a, it, it, it's a, it's a powerful pattern because what happened is no form of any type of reformation, any type of um, renewal, any type of anything that God did in a big way, nothing ever happened until somebody, one person, it, it was usually one person, had a burden for God's people. I mean, you look at you look at you know, John Wesley, Billy Graham, you you know Queen Esther. When they had a, they it all started with a burden for God's people, the beginning.
I'm going to skip a few things and go to right to Nehemiah's, Nehemiah's playbook for rebuilding, because I think that's more important to end with. The six things that I gleaned about what happened with Nehemiah and how he actually maintained during that period of time was one that he had a burden for God's people, and that's number one. Rebuilding, reformation, renewals, all of it, they always begin with a burden for God's people. Second, he had a prayerful dependence on God. Just like David prayed before he went in for strategy uh, concerning the, the enemy and what to, what to do, he prayed to God first. He didn't just go out there and say, God, help us, <laughs> and then go and do his thing. Nehemiah did the same thing. Before taking any action, Nehemiah turned to God in prayer. His initial response to hearing about Jerusalem's desolation is to fast and pray, seeking God's guidance and favor. This demonstrates his reliance on, the, on divine wisdom and strength during that time. And the focus remained aligned with God's will. He wanted to make sure his focus remained because it, 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 because of the Jewish people were left in, in, in that volatile state, right? That they could be trampled on by other enemies around them without the walls. He deeply felt, he deeply had a burden. But he didn't just go out and say, hey, I can do something. He, required, he inquired of God first. To, for favor, for, for strategy. Um, in fact, that's the next one. The first one was the burden for God's people. Second was he was dependent on God's will, prayerful. The third is strategic planning, strategies. And that's what I was talking about. Nehemiah exemplifies the focus, exemplifies focus through meticulous planning. He assessed the situation firsthand in, in, as he inspects the walls and he, de, he devised a strategy for the rebuilding. He took careful preparation for weather conditions and, 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 and how many hands he'll have be able to helping him and, and all of that. Extremely, he, he tried to anticipate all the challenge that, challenges that could arise. He had strategic planning. God will give the God gave us those, and I, we'll talk about them next week. He had a tremendous resistance to distraction, and that's what actually this message was all going to be about. So I'll probably bring that into next week as well. Throughout the rebuilding of the project, Nehemiah faced numerous distractions and opposition from external enemies, like like I said, Sinballat, Tobiah, guess him. They all attempted to lure him away from his work through threats, intimidation, and even attempts of harm on his life. And he responded steadfastly, no, refusing to be drawn into their fruitless discussions, possibly death. <laughs> I'm doing a great work. I cannot come down. Don't come down. Number five, he empowered and united the community. Nehemiah understood that completing the wall required a collective effort and focus with the people that were there. He inspired the people to work together, dividing the labor among families and groups, ensuring that everyone is invested in the success of the project. This particular type of unity helped maintain a focus and morale despite the daunting task. We all have a part to offer, and we say this over and over again. In fact, I think even Greg mentioned it on, on Tuesday night about the, the well, the, the, he was named in the scriptures in Exodus, but he built, he, the builder of the Ark of the Covenant was named one time. He did it, and then never heard of again. What if we're one of those? I mean, we're all called to to, to, to bring in the presence of God into wherever we are, right? To be able to expand the kingdom from us. 
well, from where we're we are. I mean, that, that's very important. <laughs> this is a very important, you know, thing. It's an idea. What if it's what if it's just like you're one brick away from accomplishing what what God really wanted to do in your life? I mean, honest. I mean, think about it. We all have a part to play, and it's not a game. This is something that's a serious. It's it's what God designed us for. So he empowered the community to help. And then when the, when the work was completed, there was gratitude. His focused leadership led to the completion of the wall in just 52 days. Now you have to understand, this wall was not just a little wall. It was about two and a half miles long. 40 feet high, and 8 feet thick. They did it in 52 days. Two and a half miles of wall. Isn't that awesome? <laughs> the people had a mind to work, right? He led the community in dedicating the wall, and he emphasized gratitude and worship, ensuring that the people's focus returned to their spiritual commitments. It wasn't that they raised Nehemiah up on a stool on a pedestal. It was the celebration of a people coming back to God. I think that in our own lives we're, you know, we can become distracted pretty easily in our in our focus and whatnot. Some of the distractions, I mean, that that happened in the, in the in in history historically are are hugely devastating. Like you know, Chernobyl, <laughs> World War One, <I, laughs> you know, um, those all kind of ha- actually both of those happened as a, as started out as a distraction. Did you know that? World War One started out with the driver actually taking a wrong turn because he was distracted, pulled up in front of pulled up in front of a building where the person that had already attempted the assassination on this particular person that I can't remember his name. Fran- Francis? Ferdinand. And what happened was is he took the opportunity to kill him because he pulled up right in front of him. It was, a, it was a distraction. And then one thing led to another. Alliances were made all over uh, Europe. And then World War One. All because of that one assassination when it was the wrong turn by the driver. Maybe. Unless you're a conspiracy theorist and, that, and that's not true or whatever. I don't know. But that's how I saw it. Or how about all the different mishaps that happened in 1986 in Chernobyl? All the different mishaps. It was like one thing after another after another. They forgot to do this or they didn't add their math the correct way. You know, they were on the metric system and they were not on the metric system. And they're trying to see how those numbers met, and they didn't meet. Oops, it was it, it was completely dis, dis, all fumbled up, and it ended up in a meltdown, right? There's a vast amount of the country now that you can't live because of that, all because of distracted people, workers that didn't know, really know what they were doing, didn't check their across their T's and dot their eyes, you know. Now. I'm not saying that all of our distractions are going to end up with a total meltdown, but sometimes they do. I don't know. I mean, if you've never had World War One with your wife or World War Three <laughs> with your spouse, <coughs> sometimes you know where that's where meltdown comes from. Is from a nuclear reactor melting down, meltdown, have meltdown. God can help you with those things. Come, just make an appointment with Gwen and I. <laughs> Yeah. So perhaps your, you know, your distractions don't cause a nuclear meltdown or, you know, the next world war. But uh, and maybe that you're not, you know, called to have that tremendous great task of rebuilding the wall of, you know, like Nehemiah was. Um, but we all have our part to do and our part to play that the, that the Lord has given to us. Um, one of the things that I, I saw that the Lord was speaking to me, and I'll finish with this, was our kids are just just now recently getting into clay and I have a polymer clay that that they really really like and so and they spend hours and hours with this stuff 
building and creating and making animals and making teapots and all this crazy stuff. Uh, my kids are like really artist type, you know, uh, prone personalities. Um, and I love it because that's that's where they, they I know they came from me, right? Um, but anyway, it they just got into this clay thing, and and the first things that they say usually in the mornings because it's like an all day thing. Um, I give them this big lump of clay, and they're like, "What should I make? Tell me what to make." And I'm like, "Oh, honey, well, whoever, which whichever one it is at the time, asking me the question, just make me something great." And they're like, okay. <laughs> so, so they built flamingos and all, I mean, crazy stuff. And, and uh, you know, some of them are really a lot better than others, but but they all have the same heart. And and Emmy, especially like as the youngest, four years old, it's not even for four-year-olds. It should be like for eight-year-olds and up. But she'll create this stuff and, and what have you. And then she'll just smash it. And then she'll make more and she'll smash it. She'll have me look at it first. Oh, that's nice. Oh, thank you, honey. That's great. And then she'll smash it and make some more. But the other kids like to, to make the, the items and then we, we bake them and they, they harden and they can use them as toys for whatever they're using or whatever. Really cool knickknacks. Give them to the neighbors. So anyway, um, so just to see the, the different personalities is pretty fun. But you know what the Lord was saying in this in this whole process and in the Nehemiah and the building the wall and the, in the, in the, in the rebuilding and the reformation and different words, restoring the, the, the past to dwell in. The, 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 all these different things are pointing me to the same statement God is making to us today is, here's a brick. Make me something great. And I think we're on a pretty good path. All signs are pointing towards that direction that we're able to do that for him. I want you to be able to go back and look at some of those things that we have taught in the last season, right? Last month and a half, two months. And I'll have I'll put I'll post a, a link, but the strategy it's strategy. These aren't just challenges. These are things, these are ways that we need to, to to be right now, that we need to have those those particular t tools in our in our belt and armor and uh, you know we need to be having the the building process with the sword next to us during these times. I'm not afraid to just you know to pray, but to take action and and after in God's will, right? I really feel that strongly. Um, I think I'll explain a little bit better. Uh, on the, in the next message as far as like the, the difference of distractions because it's going to be prevalent coming up in the coming months and weeks. Distractions, distractions. So, anyway. We thank you, Father, for this wonderful day and the chance that I got to share what you were speaking to my heart for your people, Lord. And we just ask you, Lord, that you would be with us and help us during the process of of keeping our, our no's, the correct no, for leading us and guiding us, giving us discernment, where that we could spend our, our time and energy and in, uh, in where we shouldn't. Because these times are very volatile. We, we give you all the glory and all the power and all, all the glory and all the power belong to you, Father. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for joining us. You've been listening to Drs. Dennis Clark and Jennifer Clark from Full Stature Ministries. To explore more life-transforming resources and deepen your faith journey, please visit us at forgive123.com and our online school at teamembassy.com. All rights reserved under applicable law. For details, please see our copyright policy on our website. Again, that's forgive123.com.